Hello again. This is now our summary of combinatorial problem solving strategies. So I call it summary problems or farewell to combinatorics. After this lecture, we begin talking about probability. So consider first question. We have 52 cards and they have to be equally divided among the four players. How many outcomes are possible for this situation? Please pause the video, think about this problem yourself and compare your solution with mine. Naturally, for any problem there might be so many different strategies and therefore so many solutions. Let's see that. Think of it, always think of a document. Here is my document. What is happening in this uh, situation? We have in this document four boxes. And the four boxes are the distinct destinies. This is for player one, this is for player two, this is for player three, and player four. The cards must be equally divided among those boxes. I think of the cards as numbered one through 52. So in this case, uh, I, you can take play cards and imagine that each play card is just numbered 1 through 52. Now, as soon as I select an assignment uh, for, let's say, player 1, I give the player, what, 13 cards, correct? 13 cards have to be listed in this document in the right order. So, for example, if I gave player 1 cards numbered 1 through 13, when I write the numbers here, I must write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 13. Writing in the other order will be not, not binding on this document. Right? This document, to be filled up correctly, has to be receiving numbers in increasing order. Now, what is happening in here? The 52 cards, if you remember my previous analogy, are like the knights. And the players are the dragons. The fate of certain cards is basically determined by which dragon receives them. So let's see how that's supposed to work. So we have uh, 52 knights and they are assigned four different destinies. 13 go to player 1, 13 go to player 2, 13 go to player 3, and 13 go to player 4. This is our solution. You remember that this number is nothing more than 52 factorial divided by 13 times 13 factorial times 13 factorial times 13 factorial. Remember what this object, this multinomial coefficient, is supposed to count. It partitions the knights into their respective destinies, which means the categories, this category plus this category plus this category plus this category, must equal for a total sum of 52. Every knight has to be assigned the unique destiny. And uh, this just uh, is a requirement uh, how many of the knights are assigned to this particular destiny, and to the second destiny, to the, and to the third, and to the fourth. In this case, it's which player holds the cards. What changes then if I have uh, 52 cards, and I only have to divide those cards into four categories? Be very careful, right? Four, uh, four different piles no longer means that one pile belongs to player one, another to player two, etc. Right? So what happens is that uh, we look at our prior document. It was all the same.
However, I no longer have players involved. So this is crossed out. You see what happens here? So now what determines the destiny is really only the bodies, the other cards that are with you in the same pile, not where the pile is moved. So what do I do? I can use still that same form, but now that's, that form is over counting. Right? I have now 52, choose 13, 13, 13, and 13. But this means player 1, player 2, player 3, player 4. I can fill out those forms and permute them among, it, among themselves. So I can uh, take this form and maybe interchange the, the top and bottom. I can interchange, I can leave those intact or interchange there. All together, four factorial rearrangements for every particular uh, destiny initially assigned to be distributed among players 1 through 4. So I divide by 4 factorial. Let's see what happens with the new situation. Now we have 52 cards and we want to divide among 4 players but no longer requiring equal distribution. So we have 52 distinct objects to be arranged among four distinct destinies, but it could be that uh, some players go, get no card whatsoever. How can we simulate the situation? Again, always press pause before watching the video on. Try to see if you can figure it out on your own. Let's see what happens then. Again, I want to have um, a very clear picture of what's happening. My form will be, this is what happens to card one. So this is uh, uh, what's going to happen to card one. And this is what's going to happen to card two. Then we have card three. All the way to the 52nd card. So in here, since I have players 1, 2, 3, and 4, I will assign a number. So the card, in a sense, basically here you put a number that assigns the card to the player that will pick it. So there are 1, 2, 3, 4 possibilities. That is, if this number here is 1, it means card 1 was assigned to go to player 1. If this number is 3, it means the card was assigned to go to player 3, and so on. So you see, that means that we have one experiment for card 1, another experiment for card 2, another experiment for card 3, and onwards until the 52th card. With each number in here being 1, 2, 3, or 4. So what do we get? We get 4 possibilities for four players times four possibilities for the four players that can pick for, for, for each of the players that can pick card number two times uh, four possibilities for card three all the way to four possibilities at the last card so this is uh, one two three and fifty two so all together this makes four to the power of 52 possibilities. Huge number. Notice that if I write 1, 1, 1, 1, everywhere 1, that means that I give uh, all the cards to player 1, and the other players, they receive 0. Let's move on to the next problem. Suppose that 52 cards are now divided perhaps into unequal four piles. In other words, each pile is not empty, containing at least one card or more, and we have to have four piles. How many outcomes are possible for this situation? This is a rather difficult problem, and I could not come up with one neat formula, so my solution involves recursion. 
make sure to pause the video and try to solve it on your own. Perhaps you will have a much smarter idea than what I had. So this is what I thought to do. So we will first define this object. So we have n k of little n. And this means number of partitions of k of uh, of n distinct objects into k files. This will be a number that if somebody was meticulous enough, they could consider all possible arrangements, all possible piles. I imagine uh, that, well, what you do is you break the n objects into the k piles and take a photograph and then uh, break it differently into a different collection of piles and take a photograph and then you have a pile of photograph each, <laughs> each photograph representing a unique situation. Make sure that you understand that uh, all that can be distinguished is um, which objects, which of the end objects are together and which are not together. That's what distinguishes the piles. Several, several calculations for this number are simple. For example, if I were to try to uh, calculate this, that's very simple. That means I have to have n objects, and I have exactly the same number of piles. Now, what, means, what it means is that I place first object in one pile, second object in another pile, and so on, right? There is only one possibility. So this number must equal to one. Another equally simple calculation is this is that if I have uh, that, if I have one, as my, well, my, I have to have only one pile of any number of n, what is that? This is also obviously one, yes? So let's try to understand how this number changes um, in terms of some previous step. So how is, so let me try to see what is the situation with n, k of n. Can I reduce either k or n? Well, think about it, right? So in this collection, I might think that there is one card that is very special to me. Imagine it's uh, card number n. So if I have uh, k piles here, the way it could happen is that I, I, just, I just pay attention to the following. Either the last card is separately on its own, or it is not on its own. So what happens if it's on its own? If the card is on its own, then I can imagine uh, removing it, and then I have the number of piles is by one less, right? I have k minus one of n. k minus one of n. And that means, uh, now, now I, of n, um, my apologies, of n minus 1, yeah? So I have, if the, if the last card is on its own, if I take it out, I am left with k minus 1 piles, and uh, in those piles I find uh, little n minus 1 objects. Now, you see, so, so then, then that basically if the card was on its own, that would be, uh, that would be the number of uh, k piles where the last pile, where the, where the, k, where the, where the last pile, the k pile contains my special item labeled n. Now the other possibility, of course, is that uh, the last card was not on its own, right? If it were not on its own, then what, what was the situation? Then if I were to remove it, uh, I will still see the same number of piles. If I were to remove it, I will, see, I will still see k piles. And uh, in those piles, I will see n minus 1 objects, correct? 
but now I removed it, what is the situation? I removed it, it could have been in the first pile, the, the end object could be in the first pile, or in the second pile, or in the third pile, or the fourth, or fifth, or onwards, right? So there, uh, there are exactly k possibilities here. So I multiply by k. So again, uh, to reiterate, this means I break, I break this number into two numbers. Uh, this is all the photographs in which I observed uh, in which I observed the special last card to be on its own. So when I removed it, I was left with k minus one piles and n minus one objects. So that means n card by itself. Whereas what is this? This means and card not alone. Again, if the nth card is not alone, then when I remove it, I still see k piles. But once I removed it, I see n minus 1 objects. And the card I removed, now I no longer know where it used to be. It was either in pile 1, or it was in pile 2, or it was in pile 3, or etc. That's why I have I, I multiply by k for all the possibilities. So first pile we have this many objects. Uh, if it's in the second pile we have this many partitions uh, in objects. Good? So to drive the point home, let's make a, a simple calculation of how that recursion formula is supposed to work. So Let's try to do it. What we have is, let's try to calculate uh, what it means to partition into four piles. Well, the number of objects I will select, let's say, let's try to partition six objects into four piles. What is that going to give me? Well, uh, that gives me, according to this formula, the number of partitions of into three objects of five, so the, num the number of partitions into three piles of five objects plus six, sorry, plus not six, but plus four, plus four, and uh, number of partitions into four of five objects. And then I continue breaking this uh, further. What is this? And 3 of 5 will be n, according to this formula, it will be n 2 of 4 plus 3 n 3 of 4. Yeah? Plus, I partitioned the next guy, so this would be 4 and 4 of 5 will be will be n3 of 4 plus now uh, now plus 3 well, it's 4 so it would be plus 4 and 4 of 3 Now, observe that n4 of 3 will equal to 0. So that is n2 of 4 plus 3 n3 three of 4 plus four and 3 of and I can continue this process until until I reduce uh, until I reduce to the situations where I can read. Again, let's add the the, the, the this, this observation is that if I have uh, n k of n that equal to zero if k is bigger than n, right? So we can observe that as well. 
So I hope you understand how that recursive formula is supposed to uh, be working. Let's now see uh, what happens in question five. Suppose now I take all those cards and I dip them in black ink, making them no longer distinguishable. How many ways of dividing them into four equal piles? Well, think about it. Uh, the, 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 we have to have equal piles, so uh, the first pile will consist of 13 cards, second pile of 13 cards, the next pile also of 13 cards, and the last pile of 13 cards. There is no need to arrange anything. I just uh, count first 14, I make a break, count the next 13, I make a break, etc. I cut it because they are all the same. There is no need, reason to, uh, to move them around. And that means that there is clearly only one possibility. Very simple question. Only one possibility because take first 13, the next 13, the next 13, they are going to be equal piles. And there is nothing to do here. There is only one possibility. Now let's consider question number six. Suppose we have 52 black cards, not necessarily distinguishable. And they are divided, so not distinguishable, my apologies. The cards are not distinguishable. They are divided into four possibly unequal files and assigned to four players. How many possible outcomes? Well, I hope you recognize the situation as x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4, and that's supposed to equal to 52, where x1 is the number of cards player 1 will get, x2 is the number of cards player 2 will get, etc because uh, each player has to get some cards in this problem, we see that xk is bigger than or equal to 1. And so what do we do? We take uh, 52 cards. Between them, there, uh, there are 51 spaces. So it's 51. And we need to partition into, we need to pick exactly three of the spaces, because that will partition into four. So it's 51, choose three. And we are done. Now let's consider a few more ideas. Here is question seven. Suppose we have 10 children, they come to a party, and three of them are very good friends and have to be seated together. We have to sit those children for the cloud presentation in one row of 10 individuals. How many ways of sitting them in a row? Well, you can of course figure this very quickly by other means, but again, I encourage you to document what you do. So here is a document that I would have considered. So in my document, I would see uh, this input, which is the order by which friends are arranged. So the friends are labeled uh, by numbers one, two, and three. And the, remainder, the remaining individuals are labeled uh, by uh, the numbers, uh, by the numbers four, five, six, all the way to 10. So what do we observe here, right? So uh, we observe that we label the friends here, and, uh, and then once we label the friends as, when we, when we put the friends in a particular order, so suppose that I will sit the friends in this order when I read it, uh, from when I walk by them from left to right. So let's say I see first, I see a friend, labeled by one, then by two, then by three. Okay, so I see one, two, three. I could have, of course, uh, seen a different pattern. Perhaps I could have seen uh, two, one, and three. Okay, how many ways are there to fill in this box? There are clearly three factorial ways to fill in the first box. Now, for the other box, I will I will label the friends as one unity. They're going to, going to be one object. They are uh, going to be conjoined twins. So imagine that triplets, in fact, right? So I take them and I connect them 
like in that movie, the human centipede. We are now one object, and this group is going to be labeled as one. Now, I can see this group anywhere among those cells. How many cells do we have? Three cells are collapsed to one. And, uh, and, so, and, and then we have other non-attached individuals. They are seven non-attached individuals. So altogether, we have items uh, one through, where, where the friends are now one item, one through eight by labeling them, right? So this has, the second box has cells one, two, three, all the way to eight. And uh, let's say if I write uh, the number, if I put here, let's say, the number 1, and here I put the number 2, and then 3, and all the way to 8, what is that, does that translate? It means that if I am the clown, and I walk from left to right, I first see friends 1 through 3, then I see the lonely individual whose short is 4, then I see the lonely individual whose short is five, and uh, this would be the lonely individual whose short is ten. Okay. So how many ways of uh, filling in this information? Well, clearly there are eight factor. There are eight numbers here among eight cells. There are eight factorial ways to fill it in. And so my answer is clearly three factorial multiplied by eight factorial. Okay? Hopefully that was easy. You could have obtained this number without writing, without the effort of writing this document, I'm sure. But, again, this is the best way I have discovered to try to avoid mistakes. It's very, very easy to be wrong uh, when you're counting. And that's very challenging. So when you see the situation clearly, in other words, when you devise a way, a code, to document the situation, you will give yourself some measure of safety. Let's consider now what it means uh, to be on a, on a merry-go-round, right? When, they, when the children are seated in a merry-go-round, um, there are going to be certain permutations, certain linear permutations done uh, that no longer mean the same thing. Let me explain to you what I mean. So when, when people are seated in a row, I can think of, uh, the, uh, I can write their names uh, on a piece of paper from left to right, and I see the beginning, and I clearly see the end. So A, B, C, D, if I have four individuals, individual A, B, and C, and D, and they're sitting in this word, in this uh, order, I see the word A, B, C, and D. Uh, now imagine that I now place them on the merry-go-round. Mathematically, that means that I take this piece of paper and I fold it, and I make it into a cylinder, where uh, the edges, the beginning and end of this paper, are now glued together, so I no longer know how to, uh, I no longer know how to distinguish, no longer know how to distinguish between, uh, between uh, the end and the beginning. In other words, this, uh, this hole, this beginning and end, I just made it visible, but when the cylinder is glued, it's, a, it's, it's going to be a perfect cylinder, and then you might read the word A, B, C, D when you look at them, or if you begin first staring at person B, you will see the, the pattern as B, C, D, A, or if you start looking at person number C first, you will see the, this word as C, D, A, B, and if you start looking at D first, you see D, A, B, C. You see, all those words mean the same thing. The only difference is that you chose a different beginning and a different end. Does it make sense? So when you place people in a row, the beginning and end is dictated to you. But if there is a cylinder, there is no natural beginning and no natural end. You go in a circle. Okay? So, to sit them on a merry-go-round is to interpret them as sitting on the cylinder where there is no natural beginning and no natural end. How do we deal with that new situation? What then does the cylinder mean to us for combinatorics? Well, think about it. Here, 
the beginning and end is dictated to you, but here you can decide where to cut. You can decide uh, where the beginning will be and where the end will be. So imagine the carousel is going around and you wait until you begin seeing the friends. The friends maybe are wearing a red shirt, so you can point at them and you see as the carousel goes, you begin uh, seeing a friend, first friend, next friend, next friend, and you stop once uh, the cycle repeats, once you again see the friends. What does it mean in terms of the document? We'll get it here in uh, document A where, where we place them in a row. We, we were, um, we will would see the friends wherever they are placed in the row. It, it would coincidentally in this case, the friends were the first, but they could have been second, third, fourth, etc. Here, once they are on the carousel, I can always decide uh, which category, which of those uh, of the individuals do I see first? Which category pattern uh, do I see first? So I will focus on the friend group. So as soon as I see the first friend in the carousel, I begin uh, counting. As soon as I uh, see that first friend again, I stop. So that means that in the document, here we could have written any number 1 through 8, but here the number is fixed. I don't have access to box 1. This is 1, and I cannot change it. Because I will always begin my observation observation with the friends. It's like beginning my observation with 8. Uh, this box is the relative position of the friends. It, it can still be changed. I can still put uh, 2, maybe 3, and 1. I can put any number. So this has three factorial possibilities. Here, I, uh, I can put maybe 3, 2, 8. I only, have, um, I only have control over boxes 2 through 8, only through uh, 7 boxes. So it's no longer 8 factorial, but 7 factorial. And my answer is therefore 3 factorial multiplied by 7 factorial. That's because here again, I could decide, uh, I could not decide what's the beginning or, or end. Whatever, I, I cannot look at this uh, and see two as first, if, if, if I saw one first. Whereas in here, if it's a carousel, it's round. Either as I walk around the carousel or as the carousel rotates, I, will, I can start looking at this form. It's basically it's, it, one and eight, it's connected, it's on, it's on the cylinder. I can start from the number one, which means this form can be adapted, the same form can be adapted to deal with the carousel situation, but I will not have access to the first box. It will be by default printed one. Let's see if you understand this idea by, or try to solve a general friend on a carousel question. Now let's consider this generalized camp problem. Suppose that we have a total of n children, and uh, n is equal to n1 plus n2 plus all the way to nr, where n1 is the number of children from uh, camp 1, n2 is the number of children from camp 2, all the way to nr being the number of children from camp r. How many ways to sit them in a row for a clown performance, if children from same camp must sit together. And B, the same thing, but now we want to sit them on uh, a merry-go-round. Again, guys, press pause and try to think about this problem. Now let's go through the solution. I always try to think uh, in terms of uh, a bureaucratic procedure. This is a very litigious society, and if you do something incorrectly, you can get sued. So, you want to document your behavior. You want to document that you followed all the guidelines, all the rules, that you were keeping the children safe, that you protected them from predators, etc. So, how do you do that? Okay, so uh, on my form, is going to look like this. So for question A and for question B, the forms will actually look identical. So here uh, I have um, a cell containing N1 places, 
and that is uh, arrangement for children from camp one. Then I have another cell to arrange logistically the children in camp two. So that means, for example, I might uh, place, just for simplicity, I might uh, label children from camp one. They have numbers one through n one. So it is one, two, all the way to n one. So that's one way I list them out. Maybe here it is uh, also one, two, all the way to n two. I am free to uh, put two first and one second, or any other arrangement uh, of this uh, cell, of those individuals, I am free to change them, right? So I am then uh, putting them in this block, and then I will fuse them. In my mind, I imagine I fuse them and I make one super child, a human centipede child out of children one, through children n one. I'm that terrible. I do the same thing for children from camp two and uh, for all the way until camp R. Now those children are fused into super children. I can imagine that camp 1 is colored red, camp 2 is colored green, camp 3 is colored blue, etc. So then, when I place them in a row, I imagine that what I see over here is uh, once they are attached like this, I want to know how to group those blocks, which is first block, which is second block, which is onwards, right? So, uh, C1, is the super child one. Where do I see it? See one if I if I'm the clown walking from left to right of the row. So I'm making my performance and I walk from left to right. So I might see something like maybe two and then one and maybe all the others are in the right order and R. What does it mean? This two here means that uh, the first camp I see as I walk left to right is camp two followed by camp one, followed by the next camp, right? So this here is uh, telling me uh, how to compile uh, those uh, chunks from the camp to produce a full row. What goes first? So camp two goes first, camp uh, one goes second, maybe camp three goes third, all the way to camp R. Okay? So I, 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 I and, then, and then notice, if I have this code, if I were a computer, I have this code, I first uh, read uh, those categories, that will tell me in what order to read those cells. So that means I first read cell 2, then I read cell 1, then maybe I read cell 3, 4, 5, all the way to cell R. And uh, then when I begin reading the cells, this will tell me uh, which numbers to read first. Right? So this tells me read uh, child 1, then child 2, then child 3. So this code will fully tell me the information about the sitting arrangement. How many possibilities are there for this uh, code in part A? Well, look at it. Uh, this has n1 factorial possibilities. This has n2 factorial possibilities all the way to nr factorial possibilities. So we have n1 factorial times n2 factorial all the way to n sub r factorial. Okay? Uh, now, times this. Uh, this uh, has R letters. We identify camp 1 as number 1, camp 2 as number 2. So, then additionally multiplied by R factorial. Remember, that's the generalized principle of counting. So, you see, all the exercises we have solved thus far, it's just, it was an exercise to reduce to the simple principle of counting. How do I devise a code? That's what you want to think about. That was question A. I hope it was clear that because of this form, I now see that uh, this number is the number of possible outcomes uh, of placing those children for a clown performance uh, in a row. So, and so what we have is the camps, and the last part tells me uh, which camp to read first, which camp to read second, and then within the camp I see the respective linear order. What is the difference between question B when those children are placed on a carousel? Well, the difference is this. Look at it. Here, I am not free to choose my beginning, and I'm not free to choose how it ends. The beginning is when, I, when I'm the clown walking from left to right. Two here means I first see camp two. There's nothing else I will see when I walk left to right. If it is a carousel, there is no beginning and no end. So I... So I can choose my beginning, and that will determine the end. So choose your beginning, 
I am free to say that uh, uh, when I look at a carousel, I always see camp one first, right? Because they rotate. So, or I walk around it, it doesn't matter. You know, on a cylinder, I can decide where to cut it to flatten out the cylinder and make it into a flat piece of paper, into a row. Which means that this number here, can you see it? Is fixed at one. I decide to start reading at one. What about the other numbers? The other numbers, all the same. I mean, I'm free to, uh, to arrange the, this piece of the um, this piece of the carousel is perfectly linear, so this would be 1, 2, all the way to n1. This means that I decided to arrange this camp based on the, uh, maybe camp 1, I decided to arrange them by numbers 1, 2, 3, etc. Right? Now for camp 2, perhaps I will decide to put 2 here and 1 here, and maybe the others are all the same, onwards. And here, now I can maybe put a 3 here, maybe r here, you know, a rearrangement. So what happens now? The beginning is all the same, so it's n1 factorial times n2 factorial all the way to nr factorial, but here I have no control at 1, it's fixed, so I only have r minus 1 possibilities, r minus 1 factorial uh, ways to write this number. Does it make sense? So this means I always start reading at 1, and if I see 3 afterwards it means well, on the carousel, I see, I see, I, I first begin uh, watching the carousel. As soon as I see the first individual from camp one, I begin looking. Then, the next uh, camp I notice is camp three. So the way it reads is that I always start reading from camp one. That's always first. And then in this case, because the number is, is three, it will be camp three. And the last apparently is camp R based on this particular form. So you can see that uh, I have n1 factorial, n2 factorial, all the way to nr factorial times r minus 1 factorial, and that is a cylinder, um, the cylinder ordering. There are fewer items because, again, uh, I have the choice to select my beginning, and that will determine my end, whereas in the previous form, my beginning and end are determined for me. Let's consider one more example and finish off this review. As some of you may have noticed, I have many problems. One of my problems is something like this. So, I have a problem remembering people's names. Names seem to be arbitrary. Sometimes I have a problem remembering people's faces. They also, many of people seem to me the same. So, suppose that what my ability is as follows. I am able to tell which student belongs to which category. And suppose that I'm giving the following exam. So on my exam, I see that there are four computer science individuals. So I cannot tell those individuals apart. All I see is walking computer scientists. Exactly the same one and the other. They're not distinguishable one from the other. So then I see five math majors. I cannot tell one math major from another math major, and I see 10 sociology majors, I cannot tell those among, it, among themselves apart. You see what I'm saying? So I see three types of objects. I see computer science objects, I see mathematics objects, and I see sociology uh, objects. They are like pawns. So maybe computer science objects are like white pawns, Maybe the math objects are black pawns. And uh, the sociology, so that's computer, math, 
and sociology might be zombie plants. Half black, half white. Okay? I cannot distinguish the white pawns among themselves, the black pawns among themselves, or the zombie pawns among themselves. The question is, uh, if the exam takes, uh, takes six hours, and you remember guys, I warned you, exam one, exam two, exam three are not challenging, but the final is going to be challenging. Maybe it will take six hours, prepare for it. If the exam takes six hours, I will notice uh, different points finishing the exam. Some of them will finish in first hour, second hour, third hour, onwards, right? And I will see where they live. How many patterns can I see the students uh, finishing the exam? Where uh, I only categorize whether the student finished first hour, second hour, third, or took six hours. Well, if you realize this problem is exactly the same as the problem of the hypochondriacs. What's happening here is this, right? What are, who are the hypochondriacs in this, uh, in this uh, question? The hypochondriacs are the, wait for it, the hours. So that means what? That means uh, I want to see which of those pawns will be taken, bought, or consumed by the hours. The students, no pun intended, are the toilet paper. So, what do I see here? I see several equations. I see C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C4. That is equal to plus C4, sorry, plus C5 plus C6, and that's equal to, that has to be equal to 4. What it means? How many computer science students will be, uh, will be grabbed by first hour? How many computer science students will be grabbed by second hour, third hour, etc.? So here, CK is bigger than or equal to zero, right? So if C1 is equal to zero, it means no computer science student finished the exam in one hour. I can do a similar thing with the math majors, right? So that would be math one plus math two plus math three plus math four plus math 5 plus math 6 equal to how many math majors we have? It's 5, correct? And finally, I have the sociology students, so that would be S1 plus S2 plus S3, S4, S5, and S6 equal to 10. Here again, we have MK bigger than or equal to zero, and SK bigger than or equal to zero. Again, uh, what does it mean? This is now asking um, how many sociology majors will be consumed by the first hour? How many sociology majors will be consumed by second hour, and so on? And you can see if SK is bigger than or equal to zero. So now what is the solution? Well. For the first part, uh, this involves partitioning four objects among six categories, six destinies. So that means what? Four plus five, choose, choose what? Choose, for example, when you partition five, so choose five times, how many possibilities to do here? To get uh, the, to, to see the math people going, that would be again that would, there, there are five of them, so it would be five plus five. This five is for uh, number of partitions. It's always partition minus one. Five plus five, choose 
here, uh, what, what do we have to select? We have to select uh, five partitions again. And finally, uh, here we have 10 objects. So it's 10 plus 6 minus 1 or plus 5. Choose 5. And this is my answer. You can calculate.